Good morning. Good morning and welcome uh, to the fourth International Plant Breeding Seminar Series that we host from here from NC State in North Carolina. And uh, as it has been the case for the past three series, we're gonna have uh, six seminars in a row every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, here are the list of uh, speakers and the topics. I think we have an amazing roster of speakers and, and topics. Uh, and I will encourage you guys to attend all the seminars and also to invite other people that you may think will be interested in participating. Uh, appreciate that. So uh, today we have the honor of uh, having uh, Dr. Charlie uh, Carlos Messina. Charlie, uh, from the University of Florida, uh, talking about crop improvement in the changing uh, climate. Charlie is a professor uh, in horticulture at the uh, University of Florida. And uh, his program is uh, uh, focused on developing uh, prediction methods uh, by integrating symbolic and sub-symbolic artificial intelligence uh, his research plays emphasis on, on genome to phenome modeling uh, for the prediction of properties of complex traits and improvement of crop adaptation to current and future uh, environments. Um, Charlie works very closely with breeding programs uh, and uh, in his uh, previous tenure at Cortiva, he contributed uh, to the development of drought tolerant uh, corn in the US and Brazil. Uh, Charlie, uh, welcome. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to give you the floor, I will say, to you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure and it's, it's nice to see some uh, colleagues from here, in, like Ruben. And, um, so thank you very much. I would like to uh, talk today about um, crop improvement for a a changing climate. Let me figure this out. I assume it's not cooperating. There you go. And uh, this is a work we've been doing uh, for some times with Tom Tang and Lucas Boras in, from Corteva and with Mark Cooper over many years uh, at uh, University of Queensland. The uh, list of acknowledgements can be long. Uh, but this is uh, an, a new area of research that we are undertaking uh, here at, uh, at Florida. As I start building the, the program, uh, one of the uh, kind of breakthrough questions as I like to, to think about what is that challenging uh, big thing we wanna go after uh, in my mind is how we can harmonize crop improvement and AI efforts for agricultural systems to regenerate the environment while providing nutrition security, improve human health and adapt to climate change. Of course, I don't have an answer to that, but this is what is guiding our quest uh, uh, in our team. There are two fundamental assumptions and primitives and uh, uh, line that, that question. One is that we can reimagine agriculture as a solution to climate change and human health. There's a massive amount of uh, investment and problems today's agriculture is causing. Uh, it's in the value of uh, two trillion dollars in human health associated to diabetes, obesity, cancer, and the like, and about trillion dollars in um, in externality. So that, that's where we are today. And we think we can rethink agriculture. So is, is part of the solution to climate change rather than part of the, the problem. And uh, I will uh, um, emphasize that uh, given the amount of carbon that can sequester. And if we think about practices, certainly we can uh, achieve or imagine alternative solutions to that. The problem, at least I see, which was surprising as I, I started researching the literature, is that 
we certainly don't have an adequate framework for crop improvement for climate change. The, there are kind of a, a two camps. One is uh, on impact assessments, but they don't tell you how. And the other one um, is nothing is, uh, we just assume is going to happen. So the, the questions that I thought we'll seek to answer today is do we need to initiate crop improvement programs to that to climate change? And let me narrow it down a little bit further and say, do we need to initiate crop improvement programs for maize to adapt to climate change in the US? Uh, however, being uh, one of the, the largest breeding programs in the world and probably the longest uh, breeding program, commercial breeding program in the world, uh, about more than 100 years uh, or about 100 years, uh, from Corteva, I think we can draw some conclusions about that. And if we do need to initiate uh, programs, how frameworks and how they should look like. Um, so those are the two questions I would like to elaborate uh, or seek to answer, and it's certainly motivating uh, the research I'm doing. So as I said, there are two, two camps today. Uh, one, uh, is is using observational or conducting observational studies, looking at uh, past trends in yields. Uh, certainly these are production fields. There's uh, two high profile papers, one published in January this year in PNAS. Uh, another one is just one example out of many uh, from the Stanford group. Uh, one concluding greater sensitivity to dry uh, companies maize yield increase in the US Midwest. And what these observational studies do is they seek to deconvolute what I think is impossible to deconvolute, right? Uh, these, uh, they detrend, then they look at anomalies, they model these differences from trend against environment, and then they seek to draw conclusions about uh, different clusters uh, of performance, high, medium, low yields, and implicate that to or the trends to something about genetic improvement. The, the problem with these observational studies, and I, I argue this virtually impossible, at least from uh, considering the dynamics of how these systems evolve, is that that time series is the context of the interplay between the environment on management and farming adapting to that and the management affecting what the selections are being done over time. Genetics, uh, in the case of corn, for example, enable planting more plants, so that affect the management. And this has been going on slowly for the last hundred years. So trying to deconvolute that just by looking at the time series without uh, further detail additional information uh, in my mind can lead to misleading conclusions. And the importance of that is depending on what we advocate and publish, this can influence how society invests in what solutions. And the risk is that we may be investing in the wrong problems and then we will not be able to adapt to climate change as a society. So this is, I think, a pretty healthy uh, debate that we need to come up uh, uh, with at least uh, uh, reasonable answers to this problem. So observational study has severe limitations and can lead to uh, false conclusions. The, the other approach uh, that you will see uh, many, uh, this is one out of many impact assessments using crop growth models or mechanistic uh, models where uh, essentially, the, the logic, uh, the logical argument, uh, is a little bit as follows: We, uh, the future, uh, will be warmer, so let's find uh, a set of uh, experiments where, by we can uh, train our models to simulate the yield variation against that uh, seasonal temperature. These are manipulative experiments, so it's great. Uh, they're really expensive to run, and that's probably the reason why uh, in this paper for climate change, they use uh, just one cultivar. They fit 30 crop growth models, 
that predict this cultivar very well in this hot cereal experiment. And then we calculate, which is the impact on or simulated impact on yields of 2050. Therefore, we conclude we need to breed for heat stress. Uh, between 2030 and 2050, in this case, there's no adaptation, there's no breeding going on, there's no genetic diversity at play. So as you can see, there's a little bit of a pattern here that we try to drive conclusions on genetic improvement without genetic data or genetic studies that can support or underpin that. There, ex there are exceptions. Uh, Ramirez Villegas at, C at CIAT uh, is doing a terrific job but if you think about uh, his uh, work relative to the whole body of other uh, work driving uh, the, uh, the conclusions about uh, climate change on, on, on agriculture, uh, it's it just a drop in the bucket. So let me, so there's another approach here and I think um, it, it's very unique, uh, as I said, uh, Corteva's breeding program has been going on for about 100 years. And over the last 50 years, uh, Don Dubik's uh, era experiment, uh, it was the anniversary of Don Dubik's experiment. This, this era experiment essentially uh, were designed and implemented to answer a business manager question who were challenging uh, the, <laughs> the breeders, uh, whether they were making genetic gain. So essentially Don Dubik uh, grow the hybrids that the farmers selected over a series of years, uh, put them all in, in the uh, uh, pioneers farm at the time, and they show how uh, yields increase in that sort of a common garden experiment uh, over time. And that was kind of a, uh, a clear demonstration about the effectiveness of breeding uh, for, for corn in the, in the Midwest. The great thing is that Don Dubik and others uh, over time uh, continue conducting experiments in particular after 1990s. So uh, first was Don Dubik, uh, then Mark took over for a number of years in the last uh, five years, uh, I was conducting those experiments and now Lucas is, is doing it. So um, we, we have a wealth of information here with manipulative experiments to answer or at least seek to answer some of the questions about climate change and genetic gain. So in this case, this experiment, you will have clear information about yields and other traits you have the genetic information clearly recorded. We have the environmental locations, lot long environments, whatnot, and the management. And of course, all the we can calculate all these interactions plus the error terms. So in this case, all the elements that might have been at play throughout uh, the years, at least we have models in a statistical sense that we can calculate that derivative of yield with respect to, uh, to the genotype. So now the, the other thing to, to answer whether is, uh, we, we know genetic gain uh, or yields improve over time, then the question is, did the change in the US Corn Belt change over time? And the answer is yes. So now we can have uh, a system that's been co-evolving with a change in climate. So precipitation in, in the Corn Belt increase uh, in the last uh, century. Uh, the minimum temperatures increases and certainly the amplitude temperature decreases significantly. And I say significant show data uh, to, to illustrate the, the importance of that delta in the minimum temperature uh, on, on the biology of the plant. So now we, we have uh, a an environment that has been changing over time. And also we have a breeding system that has been operated over hundred years within that environment. So now what we can do is select 
a set of genotypes that were commercialized between, let's say, the 30s and the 90s. Uh, the 90s is, 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 an, is a good break point because uh, is when we have most of the information or most of the, the, the largest body of data uh, of performance in, in the Corn Belt. What, uh, what we can do here is because the genotype, this set of uh, the genotypes grown between the 30s and the 90s is remain constant, essentially we can create a matrix that has anywhere between 40 to 60 genotypes. Uh, and we can, those genotypes were consistently grown during 30 years. So it, this is a complete set uh, of genotypes which are not confounded with the, uh, the, the, the weather or the time. And because the one of the hypotheses that Don Dubit has, and then uh, it was, uh, validated by many other studies, it was the plant population, essentially that tolerance to stress that underpinned uh, part of the um, yield improvement. So these experiments were also conducting at the farmer's density, growing density, that normal density of 30, 32,000 uh, plants per acre with a low density around the 20 and a high density around the 36 to 38. Um, Again, uh, stunts vary between year to year because of establishment and whatnot. Um, so, so now you have uh, a, a, a complete set of G by E by M. So for each year, what we can do is calculate the genetic gain for any of these management. So here in the x-axis, you have year of commercialization of the genotype or the hybrid. This is not time per se. This is uh, for in, 2000, in the year 2000, all these genotypes were uh, evaluated. So the, the, the time is, is commercialization, not real time, not calendar time and the yield. And therefore we can calculate the slope of that uh, line, which is the genetic gain. And we can do it for the three uh, plant populations. And here, what you see, is that and the low plant populations, the yields except one year, which is a here about zero, uh, it's been always positive around 2.5 gram per square meter per year. Uh, we can think about this as a pure genetic gain. This is the kind of the biological potential of a plant in isolation. However, growers don't uh, grow isolated plants they grow canopies uh, where plants compete. And uh, what you can think here is if we grow these plants at the densities that they should be planted, uh, you can see that the first thing is the genetic gain almost triple. And the other thing is that they may be uh, flat by long, uh, by large, maybe with some trends on the extremes. Now we test things on the higher end. And here is a little bit trickier because we don't know whether this is an environmental change or some of the agronomics like uh, seed treatments that uh, may explain, but certainly the genetic gain is accelerating even when the climate, and here now you can see this is not your conversation, this is when the, 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 the plants were grown between the 19th and the 2020, uh, they are uh, yielding more than the, the old one. So you can see there's an acceleration on the rate of genetic gain. So essentially the, the newer hybrids are either taking better advantage of better agronomic conditions or the environment um, uh, or a combination of both. So I think the, it is pretty safe to, to say that the rate of genetic gain were always positive of, over these 30 years of experimentation in the central US Corn Belt with more than 17,000 records and an experimental uh, design that uh, prevent us from making false uh, conclusions like you may do when you do observational studies.
So again, comparing with these observational studies that uh, indicate that climate and agronomy, not genetics, underpin recent genetic uh, nice uh, ill gains in favorable environment. Uh, I think uh, this is part of the danger of using observational studies. We didn't find any evidence to support this conclusion. And um, we can think about then uh, what are well, the processes uh, that may be underpinning that genetic gain uh, in this uh, uh, in these conditions. And uh, here we, we have two hypotheses. One is pretty trivial, and we can think that, well, if there's more water in the system, yes, yield is going to increase. Modern hybrids at higher plant populations can transform the resources uh, with more efficiency. And the other one is, is a bit more uh, complicated to, 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 to think, but is that genetic gain increase due to this long-term adaptation to lowering amplitude temperature. You will see the information why we, we end up with this hypothesis, but there are two elements to, to this one. One is that the selection environment uh, were predictive of the evaluation environment, and, and therefore that uh, we were selecting on things that were positive. There was a genetic correlation, and therefore the genetic gains was progressing as long as the rate of change in the climate was slow enough that uh, and within uh, a range of uh, biological feasibility, um, uh, selection in the, uh, the, the evaluations, the selection environments were correlated with the uh, evaluation environments and therefore there was a positive correlation. We'll get into that framework in a, in a minute. And, there, and then the other one, as we say, there's a lower amplitude temperature which is related to something we knew about studying different traits in the era set. So first let's look at the uh, possible impact of increased uh, rainfall on yield. Uh, as, as, as mentioned before, uh, the, the change is not trivial, could be anywhere between 50 to 100 millimeters. Uh, anomaly, if you think about uh, ranges between four to 500 millimeters in the target population or environment, 25% of more water, uh, one would expect a, a significant increase in yields. What, what it turns out, and, and we are using here uh, data from a study we conducted with Mark uh, and published in 2020, is uh, date, the, 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 these uh, uh, quantiles that we feed to probably a billion simulations that uh, results from combinations of different management, uh, different genotypes created by different trait combinations in uh, environments that were uh, typical or uh, graded from the, the US um, uh, Corn Belt. And this is not just Iowa, but from the Western Corn Belt all the way to the Eastern environment. What you can see here is this a heat map, this red area. Uh, it sort of had that sort of center between four to 500 millimeters, which is what you expect uh, given where maize is, is grown. So if we use and say, well, if we were 500 millimeters TPE and add another 100 millimeters, the, the delta and the responsiveness of this material is not near enough to explain the yield improvement, at least in, in these conditions. Of course, there's a, a, a smear of possibilities, but these are combinations of uh, different management and different genotypes. So if you think about the right genotype grown in, in the, with the right management, that should be um, the, 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 the environmental uh, effect is defined by that quantile. So I think we, we are safe to discard that it's not the water increase that is driving, but something else. So there's something else we uh, hypothesized it was the amplitude temperature. And this stems from the study we conducted on light use efficiency, and we published in Journal Experimental Botany. Um, um, 
and the, the effect of selection on, on, on light use efficiency. This has come from five years of experiments with at least, I think, 20 hybrids per experiment conducted in different years in the United States and uh, the managed environments in Chile. These are uh, manicure experiments, so the light use efficiency here is reflecting the balance between photosynthesis and, and respiration, and uh, certainly this is aerial part photosynthesis. So this is the grams of mass per megajoule, so you can, uh, and this is a pretty linear relationship between this anneal at the constant harvest index with uh, by large Tom Sinclair, you can ask uh, probably down the hall from you, he will tell you that this is fairly constant by a large, for a broad range of environmental conditions. It doesn't look much when you look at the rates, it's about 0.3% a year, but in a hundred years of breeding, this is about 30% increase, which if you think it's a linear related to yield, is 30% increase in yield. This is a major contributor to yield performance. What it turns out here, and that's what the hypothesis on the light use efficiency on, on the amplitude temperature, is this a pretty strong correlation between the light use efficiency and the amplitude temperature? Not so much on the temperature itself, but the amplitude. Uh, what is the biological underpinnings? We don't really know, but we certainly see uh, these five locations. So think about uh, there's a lot of data behind each of these points. Uh, and again, the number of replications times the number of hybrids, this is a location average, it, it's significant. So if you look at the amplitude, the change in amplitude temperature anomaly, that may be around one degree. Uh, think about depending on where you are, it could go from 1.9 to 1.75. This is, six, is, is extremely significant. So what might have happened uh, throughout uh, the selection process is the environment is was pushing this was pushing the light use efficiency down and genetic uh, or selection was maintaining that uh, RUV or light use efficiency in the app kind of in a in a red queen uh, type of game but certainly uh, the, the modern hybrids are yielding more than uh, or you can see the, the trends therefore you can see that uh, genetic gain over um, come the, the effect on of, of the environment. But certainly the selecting on uh, high amplitude, uh, selected on uh, in a decreasing, if you will, amplitude temperature environment, you are continuously adapting to that slow change. So uh, the selections on lower amplitude today relative to the previous year is predictive of what may happen in the evaluation environments in the future. And this is what this uh, gen genetic and environment was uh, kind of co-evolving and influenced selections to uh, be adapted to uh, the future environment. So again, uh, no evidence that can justify this increase in sensitivity of water deficit, uh, but certainly I think this has a lot to do with the amplitude temperature effects on the radiation use efficiency, and that sort of a co-evolution between selection and the, the environment. So I think we are at the point where we can uh, at least provide the first uh, uh, answer to, to the question. Um, and I think that the maize breeding system in the US corn belt is adequate for climate change adaptation given the breeding objectives remain unchanged. So the the answer to the question, should we start breeding for climate change scenarios, again, with the caveat of where and the, the crop, it's, it seems to be no. If this rate of change, of environmental change, remains the same, and as, as it looks, it's going to happen, uh, and within the ranges of the TPE and breeding objectives remain unchanged, the answer is no. I think the, the breeding machinery that is in place is going to generate uh, commercial products that will be adapted to this new environment. However, the, the argument, and this relates to the other uh, assumption that we can reimagine agriculture, is that we need to change the breeding objectives so we can reduce nitrogen emissions and regenerate the water resources and soil carbon. 
part of the regeneration of water resources is, is part of the ACOMAX pro program where the at least the water use efficiency as you measure in yield increases therefore uh, there are opportunities there to regenerate uh, the, uh, the aquifer. So the possibility is there. I think we as a society need to start rethinking the breeding objectives and that will determine how we, what we need to breed uh, for and what sort of uh, frameworks do we need to have in place, which is uh, where do we need to go. So going back to my uh, argument about response to selection interpretation of why um, we don't see a, a drastic negative effect on, on yields and why the breeding system was able to continue to deliver more productive uh, genotypes is because of that sort of covariation between the multi environment trial selection and the target population of environment, even if the target population of environment was, it was changing dynamically over time. So in this graph, what you can see in the y-axis is that covariance. So when there is a match between the selection and the evaluation uh, environments, the covariance is high. The difference between the, the two opposites so here and there is because in this model, we are assuming heterogeneity of variances. So the simulation of DG or the generation of these uh, surface for genotype by environment interactions uh, but let's assume that if we are breeding for our 2020 uh, or 2030 target population of environments, depending on what you want to factor in when uh, you are commercializing the environment, the, the, the genotypes you are commercializing, selecting today, uh, if there is an agreement, there is going to be a, a high uh, covariance be, between the two. However, uh, apologies, if we start selecting today and we don't consider this uh, future environment and let's, let's uh, just for the, the, the argument uh, of what may happen if there's a negative correlation, uh, we can start future, uh, future human population. So if, if we are going to uh, not do nothing about the, the climate change. Uh, this is the argument of today. We need to start breathing today for the future is under that con concept. However, uh, the, the opposite may hold where if we start too early and is there still a negative correlation between the future and the current, we can start today's population in um, um, to, to benefit and deliver uh, what they be needed in the future. So. This is kind of a, a kind of get ahead to, and we cannot wait too long. So we need a, a framework that we can take this high covariance of today and monitor and make informed selections so we can tune properly the pace of that breeding program to that change in the uh, target population of environment. I think to today, uh, till today, we were, I, I suppose we were lucky that that happened. I think we should be able to be proactive uh, and be more purposeful about what we do. And this is one example uh, of one geography in one crop in the world. Uh, we have no idea in my mind uh, what's happened with the beans in Central America or rice in Africa and whatnot. So how are you going to populate the surface with all different crops and geographies? I think it's something we should start thinking on how to do and how we inform these uh, future breeding efforts because maize is there, but other crops may be elsewhere in the surface. So part of the uh, way I think about um, navigating and be prepared and inform how these breeding programs can be operated to tune their rate of genetic gain to that change in TPE is by combining symbolic and sub-symbolic AI. Um, this is a kind of a biostatistical machinery to predict these uh, G by E by M interactions. And my argument is we shouldn't ignore the scientific understanding, whether it's from quantitative genetics or uh, crop physiology, uh, and we can use statistical learning to be smart how we train and 
expand that scientific understanding and not replace it as we see in, in many publications today. So symbolic AI in my uh, simple mind is these crop growth models in some form. This is an example of a dynamic crop growth model. Uh, this animation is to bring to life and show you that this diagram is, is dynamic. Uh, this is a static representation of the topology of the network between the physiological trait, but in reality, uh, all these um, relationships are being updated uh, day by day, depending on the forcings of solar radiation, temperature, rainfall, uh, water vapor pressure deficit. This is uh, very similar to what you can find in, in Tom Sinclair's model, which would prove very effectively to effective to uh, demonstrate uh, concepts and actually show that these uh, approaches uh, work. So the, the next piece is once we have that uh, body of knowledge encapsulated in a set of uh, mathematical equations and doing reasonable things, then we question is how we are going to train and bring uh, that sort of genotypic or genetic diversity to drive this model for the different combinations of haplotypes you may have or the breeders may have in the germoplasm he or she is, is using. The simplest way to think about it is uh, using the animal model here to model the intermediate traits such as radiation use efficiency. We know there's variation. We can define it prior based on that era study. So now we can uh, think about using even the yield data, if it's not uh, RUE data directly, to uh, calculate uh, a likelihood function using, if you will, the, the yield and calculate the probability of the data that now is generated by the crop growth model using a set of known parameters and the environment. And we are going to estimate the marker effect given again the no parameters or whatever we assume is constant within that framework. Again, this will be conditional to that assumption. Uh, um, so we can then model the RUE uh, using uh, market information. So when you apply that to a very large data set, and this has been published in, in plant physiology with Christine uh, Diebenbrook, what we can see is that the accuracy difference here as we are comparing, uh, think about the uh, animal model alone, or the animal model plus a function that can help bring genotype by bar interactions uh, in a dynamic way. That's the, the delta here. That essentially is um, formally base A plus minus the crop growth model. And you can see that if the precipitation is relatively high, the GBLAP or any genomic selection method is going to do something very similar here. Uh, we don't anticipate a lot of G by E, but when you start moving into these drought, more drought environments, the delta is, is, is becoming larger and the opportunities uh, are, are much larger. What we thought it was happening here is under drought stress conditions, uh, not, not extremely severe, the number of traits and interaction of traits uh, was underpinning the yield performance and therefore it was more difficult to capture that using a, a genomic selection model. So what we do with crop models in addition to make this prediction, we can use it backwards and we can calculate uh, what percent of the variance uh, in yield can be explained by single traits just to keep it simple, I, I use this uh, red area, uh, which is, if you will, the additive component uh, and the interaction between the different traits, which is the light pink uh, area. And we can do this by any uh, level of evapotranspiration. So here, for reference, that area between uh, less than 500 millimeters on Diepenbrook's 
um, paper where you can see the higher uh, or the improvement in accuracy by bringing the crop growth model is coincides with the fraction of the variance explained by interactions between different trades and not a single trade. So in the, the data set that Christine used, the 700 millimeters and above, it's or 500 and above, you can see single trades or additive trades were contributing to performance. In this case, it was the RUE high yield potential. That was a pretty simple, straightforward physiology that was underpinning yield. However, when you get into the 400, 500, then you start getting these interactions and many different paths can lead you to success. If you go all the way to less than 250, it's about uh, silking, <laughs> silk exertion and, and survival, which is not of our interest, but it was a very simple, again, uh, trade physiology that determines what really matters. So what are the implications for climate change? Uh, so now you can think about this climate change, uh, let's say scenario five in the uh, somewhere in, in, in the Midwest and there's a jump to environment three. We are moving from a single or simple physiology that I'm in yield to more complex uh, situation where trade interactions is going to determine the success of the breeding program. And here is where uh, we can use the, the models for one hand, but also is going to uh, determine what are the likelihood of the current breeding programs to succeed and the use of the current technology. In contrast, if the climate change, again, increasing temperatures or increasing vapor pressure deficit or, or drought is going to move us from the environment to environment one, now we are going into the opposite direction and simple traits are going to uh, determine the success. So therefore, what I the, the point we're going to make here is there's not a single suggestion of we need to breed for heat stress or drought stress. It's going to the, depend on the similarity between the different environments, what sort of fraction of the trade interactions is going to explain that yield and it's you can anticipate this uh, is going to vary greatly for different crops and different geographies and in overlay with the different impact of climate change. So the reduction in precipitation, if we can predict that for different regions, it will be different from E5 to E3 than E2 to E1. So essentially the same uh, reduction or the increases in drought, it may have a quite significant difference on the success of a breeding program to generate the products, depending on where we are in this continuum of the vapor transpiration. So things are way more difficult than say, we need to breathe for heat stress. The other dimension of crop growth models, uh, in addition to enable us to navigate that sort of continuum of complexity and help breeders inform our use tools to be more successful is that not only they can predict yield, but they can predict, uh, of course, the, the evapotranspiration, they can predict uh, stover dry matter, uh, as Ed Buckler is seeking to uh, develop uh, a program to reduce the nitrogen oxide emissions. All these are outputs from the crop growth model that now uh, breeders can consider as they create more multi-dimensional selection indices that go beyond the yield and start looking at the system level. So this is just one example where we took two of the hybrids from Dippenbrook's uh, uh, estimations. We look at uh, these fronts from, from Cooper's uh, that we calculated and I showed you before. Now we can think about what is the, uh, the, if, well, the, the decisions that we can make for food production, carbon sequestration and water use and how we can uh, solve that problem uh, interacting with the different stakeholders. So um, if we need to use irrigation water to fix carbon, that's probably a really bad idea. And of course there will be different hybrids that are going to enable to uh, produce food for uh, optimal water use and, and fix the carbon. So with that, I think 
uh, getting close to, to the end of the point I want to make is some of these technologies can help us create this multidimensional framework to empower decision makers, essentially breeders, in, in, as they work with um, different stakeholders, uh, approach dilemmas. Uh, there's water and carbon and, and food. Uh, there's going to be a trade-off there. Uh, they help us deal with long-term system changes, which is not available today, but it's important for the future. If we want to fight and uh, climate change, we can select hybrids for improved carbon sequestration, less water use, and reduce nitrogen emissions, for example. And we can certainly use the models then to optimize agronomic and genetic levels to deliver value to society per uh, unit of resource use. So in summary, uh, we need a framework for climate change. Uh, I hope I, I made that point. I think we have tools, but certainly there's a lot of work to be done to enable breeders to use genetic and agronomic levers to maximize that value of each of the resources we have available. These frameworks need to predict emerging phenotypes because all these fractions of variances explained by different traits and trade networks is going to change between different environments and certainly different germoplasm will have to be evolved within that context. And we certainly advocate for advancing the symbolic AI and sub-symbolic to increase the predictive abilities and capabilities in, in breeding. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you, Carlos, and thank for your attention. Um, thank you, Charlie. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. We already have several questions and we have 15 minutes for that. Um, the first question, okay, let me see the chat. The first question is from uh, Stephen Smith. Okay, Stephen says, and, and guys, feel free to open up the microphone if I misrepresent uh, the question or you want to specify more. He says, I wonder if a greater genetic distance between inbred parents of a hybrid provide greater flexibility for the hybrid to be with greater environmental amplitudes. Um, can you? Sorry, I. You can look. You can look at the chat. Uh, well, if you can find it, is if greater genetic diversity between inbred parents of a hybrid could provide greater flexibility for the hybrid to deal with greater environmental amplitudes. Wow, that that's a. It's a million dollar question. Yeah, I wish I can answer that. <laughs> I won't be here. Yeah, I, I, frankly, I don't know. It depends on which inbreds and what is uh, bringing, what, what sort of trait is contributing to navigate in that continuum of evapotranspiration. I don't think it's uh, one size fits all. I think it depends on which inbreds, what trait they're bringing. Okay. Ruben is asking, how do you factor in the data showing that the corn belt is creating its own climate by increasing precipitation locally? That's, uh, he, he posed a, uh, reference there? I think uh, you, you can uh, look at that uh, microenvironment as uh, changes in humidity and therefore in evapotranspiration, for example, uh, mm -hmm. or, or water demand. So I think that the model can, can take that into account because you are, you are feeding that information to the crop growth model. Yep. But certainly, uh, it goes uh, it reinforced the point that these observational studies are really dangerous because now you have these genetics affecting the environment, which is something I probably, I, I, I thank Ruben, I need to put an arrow from G to E uh, in the Corn Belt. Yes. Okay. Uh, Jim Holloway's uh, uh, recommendation here, he encourages everyone that can try out these and other ideas with a favorite genotype or environment prediction model in an upcoming competition open to everybody. And he puts the link there to, uh, to that, okay? You wanna comment anything, Charlie? Uh, I, actually, that, that's great. Maybe uh, uh, we'll go past the, the, the message. We are uh, organizing a GYEYM conference in Australia by the end of the month, uh, which is about uh, engaging uh, all the community to uh, help us uh, think where we are at and what are the different ideas? Uh, can we uh, come up with a consensus uh, frameworks or 
can, how can we connect the, the, the framework so we are more efficient on um, how we develop these technologies. Uh, frankly, uh, I've been giving this uh, uh, talk, um, probably repeated for some people, uh, but I think uh, in this dialogue that we are having in climate change, breathers are not part of it. And I think this is a very dangerous uh, <laughs> um, thing for society not to do. I think uh, everybody assumes the varieties are going to be de de developed and created. Nobody's asking how and who. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's my... Okay. Uh, Ruben, the microphones can be open now. Uh, Randall, enable, enable that uh, function. I don't know if you want to ask a question directly or... Yeah, um, thanks, Charlie, for the talk. Uh, fascinating. Um, so uh, I was wondering, in the era hybrids, um, I assume that those were developed uh, uh, with uh, different uh, regions of the Corn Belt in mind. So um, in your experiment, do you see any signs of uh, local adaptation uh, of the hybrids? <laughs> No, I, I, Stephen Smith is in the line, so he can keep me honest here. Uh, there were different levels of emphasis on broad adaptation. Uh, the, I think the, the largest experiment Corteva ran for specific adaptation was the, um, the Aquamax study, right? Looking for adaptation to drought environments. And it was very, very strong selection pressure on maintaining parity at uh, irrigated or good environment. Uh, it's really easy to make uh, drought a maize if it doesn't grow, right? So, so I think uh, from an industry perspective, the, the broader adaptation, the better. And the other bit uh, that for sure you, you will find local adaptation or performance in pockets, um, but you have all these distributed breeding systems searching the landscape and making selections. But at the end of the day, the really successful hybrids, they tend to have broad adaptation. 1197 is one example. 1151 is another example. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can comment to that. Yep. Uh, you, can, me. you can help me here. <laughs> I... Uh, I want to ask you a question and, and get your thoughts about uh, definitely the breeding cycles have been accelerated and it looks like it will continue to be accelerated in corn, particularly to an advantage to other crops that are more difficult to accelerate, trees or even cassava there in my background. How do you think, I mean, I tend to think that the faster you can breed a crop, the more in tune could be with the evolving environment. So how much effect that has had has had in the past um, few decades, I would say, that evolution? That, that's, a, that's a good question because uh, the, this follow-up uh, study, uh, we, 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 we used the hybrids from 60 to 90 because it was a really nice uh, balance uh, experiment. We don't have a lot of, uh, the same amount of data for the modern hybrids, right? Because they start growing, let's say, after 2000. Uh, but you can see that, the, as, as you said, it seems that this faster adaptation use of technology is even accelerating that genetic gain, or it certainly is not uh, uh, hampering the, the genetic gain. It seems that the modern hybrids are even tuning that uh, or taking more advantage of the management and, as you said, the changing environment, right? The closer you are for selection and prediction yeah. environments, the better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have a hand raised by Gary uh, Hamsa. Please open the microphone and ask your question, Gary. Uh, you want to go ahead and ask your question? You need to unmute, uh, Gary. There you are. No, I am unmuted. Uh, thank you for uh, this beautiful seminar. I am happy to join you. Uh, my question is about uh, the business now. Uh, it's big and care more about the preference of customers. Uh, and you don't uh, marginalize and neglect the resilient crops. 
And my question is, what breeders do in this regard to uh, conserve the genetic resource and uh, uh, improve the resilient uh, vegetation and uh, crops to uh, face this climate change and all the problems that we are facing now? Thank you. Uh, maybe I can unpack a couple of questions there. Sure. Uh, the, the first question was about climate resilience, uh, customer preferences, and the, at least I, I cannot speak for all the industry, but I, I assume uh, other industry does similar things. Uh, Corteva has an army of agronomists connecting with the customers all the time. They're almost on speed dial for them. And they are, uh, part of their job is that helping the farmer maximize the value of the, the hybrids Corteva produce or commercialize, but also gather information about what is the, what are the needs for these customers pretty much in real time. So there's a very tight connection between the breeder, the regional agronomist and the local agronomist. And that's what the breeders do uh, in academia too, right? Uh, it's not that they operate in silos, but in the case of big industry, uh, certainly Corteva has that very, very tight connection with the farmer to understand what are the, the needs and what they are going after. I think the, the question of climate change, it's a bit broader and goes beyond industry. Uh, part of the argument here, why breeders need to be part of this, why we need to change <laughs> objectives and the opportunity to change breeding objectives is going to come from society. Uh, as I said, I, I like to eat a steak. So if I keep uh, buying steak uh, fed with corn and nobody put a price on nitrogen externalities, uh, nothing is going to change. So essentially it's us that we need to send the, the message <laughs> to, we need a different agriculture. Uh, else people are going to produce whatever society demands, right? So, and the part of the climate change, again, we can do certain things like, uh, and can prove, and you're, you're also, keep me honest here on the circle project that we can be proactive as academias show the possibilities of these possible futures. Um, and that I think is, is our responsibility, work with industry. Uh, certainly this project, uh, all the major big players uh, are listening to the opportunities to reduce nitrogen emissions. Uh, but it, it, there's so much we can do in society that need to start driving the need to do that climate change uh, or, or crop improvement. So I think having breeders in the IPCC, for example, is something really important to, to have that voice. And so we can match the voice of society demands inform what is feasible. Um, uh, we may have time for one more question if there is. Um, so three minutes to 12 o'clock. When, when you were talking, Charlie, I, I, I came back to my mind how fast uh, corn can evolve by recalling that back when I was in Iowa studying, I made a trip north to Canada and there was seldom to see corn in North Dakota and less in Canada. And then I went back recently with my rolling wheat and in Syngenta and I was amazed to see how much corn there was even in Canada, okay? So the genetic plasticity and ability to evolve is yeah, uh, my, my, I agree. Uh, as as, uh, as my uh, background in physiology, uh, I went there to Corteva and you put hypotheses and uh, the genetic diversity that you can encounter and start studying yeah. the wrong most of the time. So the IUE is one six. No, there's all this variation. When you work with the era study, it's unbelievable the, the, the biological diversity that is in corn. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's, it's unbelievable. Okay, well, thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, virtual applause to you. And thank you so much for taking this uh, challenge to be the first uh, speaker in this <laughs> series. 
Uh, next Thursday, we'll have Colleen Doherty from our uh, NC State talking uh, plants at the center of change, climate consequences for crop and plant-based solutions. Uh, I think it's gonna be also another great uh, seminar. So I, I invite you to participate. Thank you to, thanks to Brandon and Thiago for their help. And I look forward to your attendance. Uh, the recording of this presentation will be shared with you very shortly. Uh, and uh, it will be posted later on in our website, but you will receive it by email. If you are registered to this seminar, you will receive it probably by tomorrow. And it will be posted in the in the in the website uh, later on after we go, go through all the closed captioning editing. Okay. Thank you so much to everybody. Thanks, Charlie, in particular. Uh, have a, a great rest of the week, a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next Thursday. All right. Thank you. Bye.